I am so excited to see you guys and um, happy to ex um, share this wonderful panel with you to talk about STEM possibilities in our area and to have a dialogue with Dr. Calvin Mackey. My name is Rhonda Franklin. I'm a professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering, but my role here is actually uh, in collaboration with my co-director, Chris Pinnell. I am the co-director of the INSPIRE program. Since I've gotten a lot of questions off and on around what is this, how is this organized, I'd just like to take a few seconds to tell you a little bit about that. If you look at the picture at the bottom, you see a bridge. And that bridge connects the medical school and the College of Science and Engineering. And that bridge is the Institute for Engineering and Medicine, which is the umbrella organization that's helping to support the Innovation Week that you guys are here to be a part of. DMD is one of the entities or conferences that's supported by that. And at the end of the week, there'll be another one with neuromodulation. Inside of the INSPIRE program, inside of the Institute for Engineering and Medicine, there's a program to broaden participation uh, for our underrepresented students, first generation students, um, that's associated with, um, uh, that would be interested in biomedical uh, applications in, in, the, in the biomedical field. And so the INSPIRE program is organized to represent that entity. And that's what Chris and I are co-directors of. So we are really excited to have our local, some, some snippets up from our local community that's working in STEM outside of the university and to have Calvin Mackey speak to us um, around what's going on nationally. And my last point is just to indicate that for Inspire, we're looking at middle school through uh, the professions, but mostly focusing right now on high school and undergrad and then eventually to expand out with, um, hopefully from some of the discussions here, with collaborations that do this already. So what I'd like to um, do is just let, uh, calibrate you about what the panel is gonna be focusing on. We have people that represent many different sectors um, that are here today. And so we'd like to give you an idea of, from the, from the people who support programs like 3M down to the people who are implementing programs on the far end uh, will give us uh, a really brief description of what they're doing, how they're doing, what they are really excited about, and what are pain points or, or wishes that they'd like to see in the space. Before they start, I'd like to at least let Chris uh, introduce himself as well. Yeah, thanks very much for being here. We really appreciate it. My name is Chris Pinnell. I'm a cancer immunologist. I work with mice, so this is the most people I've seen in a long time. <laughs> so I'm pretty happy about that. Um, <laughs> and I have a passion for education, which is why I'm working with IEM and the Cancer Center. So this panel is outstanding. I'm really looking forward to hearing what you have to say. And um, I'm also the timekeeper. So you each have roughly five minutes. When you've got one minute left, I'll hold up one finger just to give you a heads up. And that's about all I have to say. Thank you again for being here. And actually, one more thing. We, uh, we would like to get audience uh, questions at the end, and so we'll allot time for that. Thank you. Okay. Good evening. Oh, perfect. Wow. That scared me. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm Jackie Berry. I'm with 3M. I'm a part of 3M Gives, which is the philanthropic arm of the company. And first of all, I just want to say thanks, Rhonda and Chris, for the opportunity to be here this evening and to participate in this wonderful event. And I have to say again, Dr. Mackey, I really enjoyed your comments today, found them incredibly inspiring. And um, it kind of reinforced, I think, some of the things that we've been thinking and want to share a little bit more about what 3M is, is doing in the uh, STEM and skill trade space for us. So as you know, 3M is a, a science-based company, and we also manufacture lots of stuff. So STEM is really uh, in our sweet spot. I mean, looking at how we can support students, and in particular, underrepresented students, and have them advance in STEM and skilled trades is our top priority. So all of our giving's focused in that space. The, um, the other thing that we, we're looking at, too, so 
as a STEM based as a science company, you know, focusing on STEM is important. But we also want to look at you know opportunities to have more diverse perspectives in our own company in terms of developing new solutions. And we know with everything going on in the world now, we need everyone at the table to participate in solving some of our most pressing challenges. And the third piece of that, we also recognize that STEM jobs are growing at a faster rate than other jobs in other industries, and they also pay well. So there's that advance in economic equity piece there. So those are kind of the three main reasons that we're focusing on, on STEM. One of the things that we did, I think right at the end of 2020, we decided that we would announce a goal. So we announced a goal to support five million learning experiences. Learn, I say STEM and skilled trades learning experiences for underrepresented students um, with the intent of helping um, marginalized families advance economically. Again, going back to STEM jobs pay well, so we want to make sure that students are, have a chance to advance in that space. And when we talk about underrepresented, we're using the National Science Foundation's definition of those that are underrepresented in, in science and engineering. With an exception of in certain communities, there are populations that aren't included in that definition that we want to support as well. So we've been really intentional in terms of you know, who we're supporting and the programs that we're investing in. So um, you know, when I had to go around the company and talk about this new goal that we announced, people were like, okay, five million learning experiences in five years, so that's a five-year goal 20, by 2025. They were like, well, what does that mean? How are you going to approach that? Are you gonna do just a video and say, you know, students watched it and they'll be inspired? Uh, we've really been methodical about it. We're taking the approach of investing in opportunities that inspire students' interest. So starting early, how do we start students thinking about science early on? We have our own science encouragement programs. We have 3M Visiting Wizards, 3M Tech Talks, where 3Mers will go in and talk about their careers and you know talk to students about what it means to be a chemical engineer. How did you get you know through? Uh, grad school, undergrad school, I mean, sorry, undergrad and then grad, I guess, don't want to get it out of order. But at any rate, you know, again, just sharing those experiences, and I think that's so incredibly important, and having students see people who look like them that have done this. So that's one of the things we're doing. So that's the Inspire category. We're looking at probably about um, the significant portion of that five million coming from the Inspire piece. The, we also recognize that students need to perform academically. So we're looking at ways that we can improve student outcomes in science and math. So we're you know, funding opportunities to give students a chance to take what they've learned in the classroom and actually apply it in real life settings. So that's kind of the, that improved space. And then finally, once you know, students are excited, they're doing well academically and they decide that they wanna go on and major in a STEM field, how do we provide scholarships for them? Um, you know, or they want to go to grad school, how do we support that? But we also recognize, too, giving students scholarships, that's just not enough. I mean, we need to make sure that they're able to succeed once they get to school. So what are the support, uh, college and universities, what are the support services that they need to make that happen? So that's our approach. I mean, we have this goal, we're on track. I think last year we uh, made investments, and through our investments and also our volunteerism, we were a little bit over a million. So we're on track now, if we can do that, for the next four years, we will reach our goal of five million learning experiences. So I'm sorry, Chris. I, I, okay, sounds great. I'll turn, turn it over to you. Oh, oh, my pain point. Um, I think the biggest pain point, I mean, we're looking at access. So how do we really identify those programs in the community that are delivering the outcomes that we want to see? So the numbers are important. Don't get me wrong. We have that five million goal, and that's what I'm evaluated on. But we're also looking at those um, programs that have outcomes that are really driving the outcomes that we want to see. We want to see students do well and we want to see students go on and pursue a STEM career and, and be successful. So we're really looking for you know, programs that will help drive that. Uh, good evening, my name is James Burroughs. I'm the uh, Chief Equity and Inclusion Officer at Children's Minnesota. Uh, Children's Minnesota is not Children's Gillette, it's not Children's Masonic, it's not Children's Museum, it's uh, Children's Minnesota. We are the largest uh, freestanding um, uh, pediatric system in the state and also one of the largest in the country. I uh, have about 5,000 employees. Um, my role there, in addition to equity and inclusion, is also government relations and community relations, so advocacy and then also uh, community partnerships. I'm excited to be here for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is Dr. Mackey is a Morehouse man, and he is a, my classmate uh, from Morehouse. 
Um, and for those of you who were at the earlier session, I want to share with you, his remedial reading class also had a brother in there named James Burroughs. Uh, so Dr. Addie Mitchell taught him and I, uh, and I also had one of them low SAT scores as well. And I say that in this audience, especially, especially in Minnesota, we tend to sometimes give up on our black boys. Um, let me say that real clear. I've been in Minneapolis public schools before, worked there a long time, and I've seen young men who have the credentials that I had at that age get given up on. And that's something that can't happen because they turn out to be the men you see up here now as well. So excited to be here. Uh, my day job, I'm responsible for equity and inclusion implementation at Children's, which includes three big bucket areas. Diversifying our workforce, um, that means doctors, nurses, uh, radiologists, phlebotomists, uh, everybody in the hospital system, also accountants, lawyers as well, uh, and other uh, hospital functions. When I started there in 2019, uh, we had 19% people of color, um, and we're not, now we're about 25.6% people of color. Do we measure stuff? Yes. Uh, and I'll make sure we measure because what me gets measured gets done, and our goal is by 2024 to have 34% of our workforce be people of color. Why? 45% to 50% of our patients are people of color. They need to represent and they see people like them serving them in the hospital system. We also have goals around supplier diversity, where we spend our money. Uh, when we checked last year, we were spending less than 1% with businesses of color. We have a goal this year to increase that by 6% uh, as well. Another one of our goals is ending health disparities. Uh, like any other healthcare system in this state and this country, there are health disparities. And our largest ones are between black patients and white patients around uh, well-controlled asthma and combo vaccines. So we have what's called a health equity patient index that we measure on a monthly basis. And we have strategies for our clinicians uh, to how we reduce that as well. That's part information, part service, part cultural humility, part making sure we give equitable care to all of our patients uh, and families uh, as well. The third bucket of what I do is um, uh, deals with the social determinants of health. So we have a department called our Collective for Community Health, which started about two years ago um, officially, but we've been doing the work for about eight years. Uh, we have what's called community um, navigators, and those navigators work with our patients and families. If you come in and you have food insecurity issues, you have housing issues, you have issues related to legal uh, and need a lawyer, we service those. We have two lawyers on staff that we have to service those legal needs. We work with housing organizations and food security organizations to make sure that our patients and families are taken care of. We all know that 80% of the things that affect people's health are outside the hospital system. Only 20% are affected by the medical care of doctors and nurses. The other 80% are housing, and like I said, um, legal uh, and environment uh, as well. The other thing that we also do, uh, one minute left, uh, is uh, uh, deal with um, one of my proudest moments, uh, interns. We have 20 interns every year, all interns of color um, from various colleges around the Twin Cities. Um, and we make sure that they, those interns present at the end of the summer to my CEO and myself about things that they've learned and things we can get better at as a system uh, as well. So we're excited to be here. My pain point, uh, I'm going to make it real clear. My pain point is bringing people to town like Dr. Mackey, and if I'm here a year later and we haven't implemented STEM Minnesota, whatever you want to call it, that's a pain point. Being here 30 years, we talk about stuff a lot. I want to do some stuff this time. Hello. Hello. Hey everybody, my name is Tulani Drocklu. I am the director of the Kitty Anderson Youth Science Center at the Science Museum of Minnesota. Um, I have uh, been inspired by, by what I've heard so far this evening and also earlier uh, today um, at the luncheon. Um, the Science Museum may not be known as kind of the bastion of uh, youth work, but we do have a youth program that is pretty comprehensive uh, STEM program. Um, our Kitty Anderson Youth Science Program is uh, kind of a three-pronged program, beginning with a K-8 to uh, approach where we work with partner schools um, in our community, um, uh, uh, STEM activities in after-school settings um, inside the schools uh, where we are working to uh, 
um, excite young people um, by doing STEM projects and doing STEM acti activities in after school settings. Um, also as part of that is our STEM justice approach, uh, which um, long ago I think someone figured out that you can't have STEM without um, having young people identify themselves um, in STEM. And so STEM justice is simply uh, a curriculum and a method to get young people to see STEM not just in, in them, and we're talking about um, young people of color who uh, have not had this message of you know STEM is for them and by them, um, and so our STEM justice approach really focuses on uh, developing a STEM STEM identity. And so in our K-8 approach, it's not just about uh, hands-on STEM activities in the classroom and after school, but it's also developing this this identity as well. Um, our high school program focuses on. Um, building STEM skill. Uh, and so this is based at the Science Museum. Uh, we have the whole second floor um, where we have a, a Kitty, uh, the Kitty Anderson Youth Science Center is based in there. And it's really kind of a space for exploration, both in after school, but mostly on weekends. And so all of our youth, 60 youth that participate in that program are paid. They are paid employees. And so it's partly um, to, it's a workforce development strategy, but it's also uh, part of our continuum of uh, helping young people maintain the excitement around STEM. And so what our young people are doing um, uh, is STEM projects throughout the school year um, on Saturdays and then coming in and doing some planning during the week as well. And they're getting paid for all that activity. In addition to that, professional development for them. So we're bringing in um, community experts to come and do um, you know, youth development uh, and also additional STEM skill development uh, as professional uh, development for, for our high schoolers. Uh, our program ends with uh, what we call the alumni program, which is for our young adults. And our young adults are uh, folks who are maybe making decisions about, um, you know, where do I go from here? And so we uh, place them in a position to explore uh, opportunities, both inside and outside the museum. Uh, and it all culminates with them uh, kind of reflecting back on the year that they've had, the experiences that they've had um, exploring STEM and uh, hopefully working and doing internships um, within and outside the museum. Um, in addition to that, our focus um, as we move forward is workforce, what we're calling workforce innovation. Um, and workforce innovation for us is partnering with uh, employers and communities. Um, to tackle this problem of underrepresentation in the STEM workforce. Uh, and so what that looks like for us um, uh, is having partners, employer partners that are completely um, uh, embedded in, in our approach. Um, and so we do um, some DEI training internally as the Science Museum. We've had a program that uh, is a DEI program for a long time now. And so part of participating in or uh, engaging with our youth is also doing our DEI uh, work. And so understanding how STEM justice um, uh, operates, um, but because we both want to prepare um, our young people for the workforce, but we also want to make sure that our employers are prepared for our young people as well. So I think I'm out of time. Pain point, um, you know, for us, it's, it's really um, how do we develop an ecosystem in Minnesota and move from talking about an ecosystem and really um, moving, in, moving into a space where we are creating an ex ecosystem that allows for these opportunities across our communities uh, in the Twin Cities and in Minnesota. Hello, friends. Uh, my name is Rosalind, Rosalind Palma Marchins, and I work at the Sane Foundation which is a nonprofit that operates a lot of different programming through the Twin Cities, but in particular runs um, the Conway Recreation Center out of East St. Paul. And the program that I run is a kids after school program and summer camp. It's a free program for kids from five to 12 years old. And so when I heard uh, Dr. Mackey talk about the um, cradle to career pipeline, um, we have kids coming into like my summer program who are you know four years old turning five and haven't been to school yet um, So as I develop curriculum and mentor the staff for this um, We are really trying to bring in um, 
these experiences, uh, these play-based and hands-on experiences to kids at this very uh, young age. Um, there were a lot of things in your talk today that were just really inspiring and also really connected to a lot of the work that is coming out of the Sane Foundation. So we have um, family STEM nights and we have great, amazing partnerships. The University of Minnesota Masonic Cancer Center and I have created some, um, co-created some amazing curriculum for the kids where they're getting their hands on blood pressure cuffs and petri dishes and um, talking about making clay models of what cancer is and all different kinds of really cool things. Um, we also have a donated STEM hub um, by Jamf, which there's only 20 in the world um, internationally and we have robotics and drones and um, different kinds of robots and just really, really cool stuff. So we are very, very fortunate in that way and in our partners with lots of different places. Um, but I think that what I really want to focus on is the connection between social emotional learning and STEM, which um, Dr. Mackey was referencing a lot also in his talk uh, around the building relationships, the engagement, the cultural relevancy. And um, I think it is just so important to make space. I, I loved Leah's question earlier about the STEAM. <laughs> And I've actually, I spoke to a number of different women who were um, uh, in the audience. And I think that a lot of us had this feeling of wanting to both embrace so much what you're saying and also push back a little bit, if, you, if I may, um, that you know, st STEM is not elevating um, these emotional connections or these mother-daughter dynamics in spa day or um, bringing meaning in that way. It is, it is the white male ownership of STEM that, um, that is lacking what that um, queer and female and black and indigenous knowledge um, knows, like that, that body knowledge as well. And so, I think that like when I see, like part of the social emotional learning is so much building relationships, right? And so when I think my kids are mentored by um, students who, students, uh, 18 and 19 year olds who have just graduated high school, right? So we don't have, our middle level isn't the college students, but is like sort of a recent high school graduate. And so they're still sort of trying to find themselves in, like, am I going to go to university? And I hear my staff saying things like, well, I, I don't like university culture, right? I don't, I don't want to go, um, or I don't know what I would study. Um, and these are young people who grew up in the same area, um, and a lot of them have been coming to the same rec center since they were kids, and have experienced the same like housing insecurity and food insecurity and all the things that um, the kids in our program are also experiencing. And so when we have these professionals come in, be that Sierra Club, the Masonic Cancer Center, um, our 3M volunteers who we absolutely adore, they are teaching our staff as well to, to trust kids and to trust themselves, right? So this idea of come in and it's not this don't touch anything, it's come in and touch everything, right? Come in and explore and that is something that also um, the staff just need a lot of support in feeling empowered to sort of however that develop, develops. Um, so in creating these spaces of, I think you said, non-formal learning, which I really liked, you know, when I'm hearing an 11-year-old who I know has lost his father and I know has just been living in a shelter come in and I say, like, what would make this program better for you? And he says to me, um, I don't want to wait until high school to get my hands on all that stuff where you're, like, mixing it up and there's explosions and stuff, right? And then we're planning, okay, so, like, I'm bringing in a family chemistry night and we're going to have chemists in the classroom and WISE and the Masonic Cancer Center bring those things so that kids who are 11 or even 5 can experience that. Um, that is what, yeah, that is what we want to <laughs> bring in. Um, so I guess for pain point, I would just say um, the emotional support, making enough space for our staff and for um, how just can we make STEM feel more accessible to people who have neurodiversity or um, queer people or women? Um, 
and all, you know, just incorporating all these ways that communities have to heal themselves. Check, can everyone hear me? Great, thank you. Um, good evening, my name is Leroy West, President and CEO of Summit Academy OIC, located in North Minneapolis. Um, Sum Summit Academy is a career and technical education center that, um, that we focus on on the workforce and preparing people for today, tomorrow, and the future. We're a 20-week training program um, that focused uh, on, uh, on construction. Uh, we also have IT programs, and uh, we have a healthcare program. So one of the things we do is how do we connect, you know, workforce and to STEM? And uh, what we wanted to do is to build an ecosystem so that by the time they get to uh, making a decision before high school, that they have an opportunity to be aware. Uh, what I'd like to do is, is first is acknowledge uh, that I've had the opportunity to go down to STEM NOLA and see firsthand uh, the program. It's absolutely fabulous and it was absolutely incredible. So we looked at their model and, um, and with the help of uh, STEM NOLA and, and certainly came back to really develop now the uh, shorties, right? <laughs> the STEM district and uh, really to be able to um, uh, make, make aware or uh, create an awareness of students so that they have a chance to get to see what STEM is all about so that they can make choices in the future. Um, I have a kind of a quick PowerPoint here and, and, and if we can't see it I do have some handouts out here as we, um, um, you know, as I kind of outline what our ecosystem look like. So next slide. Um, the one thing that we talked about in workforce development is what are the challenges and we know that uh, in our workforce, you know what's happening. There's a labor shortage. It was actually happening prior to the pandemic and the pandemic just accelerated. You know, we, we, we knew that, uh, you know, there was hiring signs everywhere. Restaurants were paying $20 an hour. Uh, boomers are transitioning out of the workforce. Uh, we also know that the U.S. birth rates has fallen uh, uh, 20 percent since 20 uh, since 2007 so there's going to be less people in the workforce so we have to plan for the future and we have to educate our youngsters to be able to be exposed to what type of stem related activities and all types of things and uh, so that they, we can prepare them for for the future we know also know that there's a demographic shift hundred percent of our workforce growth is going to be coming from students students of color uh, in addition, we look at the technology right now, every five years is something different. So we, it's, it's just transitioning at a fast pace. So what do we do? We create what is the solution. Next slide. So the solution, one of the things we wanted to do is uh, we begin to focus on STEM, focus training programs and uh, uh, in-demand employment and opportunities for uh, adults. Two, hands-on interactive activities and that's the STEM experience for youth and in school and out of school. And uh, that's the STEM uh, district and the STEM awareness and STEM Saturdays. Um, also a network of emerging and skilled STEM talent for employers, understanding what employers need to be able to connect what are those skills that's gonna be needed for tomorrow and what's the skill gap so that we can uh, infuse that and orientate that with our youth earlier so that they get a head start. And we focus specifically on uh, those communities in which have been overlooked, right? So we're talking about those communities right in North Minneapolis, South Minneapolis, East Side St. Paul, where they don't have the resources um, but to send their kids to STEM camp that costs $1,000 a week. So we basically bring the opportunity to them so that at no cost to them. And as well as our, our um, career technical training programs, which we are an accredited institution, nobody pays one cent out of their pocket to come to Summit. So in 20 weeks, we can take somebody from zero who've been unemployed, and in 20 weeks, we are uh, placing students, uh, our graduates, um, at 42000 a year. And if anybody else is in a household at least making $20 an hour, they now have a household income of 80000 a year, so, and which the median income in the Twin Cities is 79000 So it's the uh, a career path to the middle class. So the other thing that we, um, uh, again, um, one, one of our mantras 
And what we always lead with is the best social service program in the world is a job. So how can we be, be able to uh, uh, connect youth? It's almost like in you know, Minnesota and hockey. You know, parents put their kids in skates at age three, right? They develop an ecosystem, and all of a sudden right now we have more kids and more players in the NHL from Minnesota than any other state because they develop their ecosystem. Next slide real quick. I know I got less, less than one minute. These are the things that we're currently doing right now in terms of building the ecosystem. Um, work is up today, tomorrow, and the future. Today are the current programs that we currently have at Summit Academy, listed from construction all the way down to our service desk, to our IT programs, electrical training, and those are the accredited training programs. Our programs work is for tomorrow. These are our grades 7th to 12th grade. In 10 years, they are our workforce, our future workforce. We have a Best Buy Teen Tech Center, STEM Saturdays, we have STEM Fest, uh, and middle school STEM accelerator, we have Tech Connects, um, and our STEM links, design studios, STEM studios, cyber studios, gaming studios. We have all types of programs for that to, to expose youth so that they get a head start on making a decision as they begin to transition out of high school. And our pre-K, uh, we also have what's called the Beast. Uh, it's a double-decker bus that we drive around and we bring uh, bus to the actual schools. So it's like the bookmobile, if anybody can remember that, right? <laughs> so kids come out there to go through and we have programming right on the bus with 3D image printing on there. We also have graphic design, a number of programs that are happening on the bus, so we're coming to them. Um, so we have an array of programs. Um, and I would say one of our pain points is growth. Um, right now, we've, we've been asked uh, uh, to not only uh, continue to grow here locally, uh, but we've been asked in outstate as well. Um, we've also begun to replicate in three other states as well in terms of some of our STEM links program. So in terms of managing the growth uh, is, is a pain point. I would like to really thank a lot of our corporate partners because we could not do that without them. 3M is one. Is, is, has been a strong supporter. Abbott Labs, I think is in the room, has been another strong supporter of us. And, and I, can, I know there are a number of folks that are out here who have been supporting uh, Summit and the growth here. So I'd like to publicly thank you. And we're going to uh, continue to grow here. So thanks. Uh, could we have a round of applause for our panelists, please? <laughs> Dr. Mackey, I was wondering if you could just reflect on uh, some of the statements that you heard, and then we'll open it up for questions. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. And again, to Rhonda, Chris, John, thank you all for having me. And anytime a community comes together and talk about issues that, are, that impacts the community, the children and families directed, you should be commended. This is not happening in too many places. So these are the type of conversations and the gatherings that need to happen intentionally and consistently. Uh, and I hope this is the start of, of that happening. Uh, to everyone on the panel, congratulations on the work that you're doing. We heard that inspiration is needed, and 3M is trying to inspire up to 5 million people over the next five years. Uh, James talked about, you know, we talked about uh, health equity and social determinants of health. It's very difficult to start focusing on career and life when, I, when my health, uh, uh, if I can't eat, I don't, if I don't know where I'm going to live and things like that. We talked about social, social justice. Uh, I've even wrote, written papers about how STEM is a social justice issue. And I got to have uh, my place in the world before I start talking about what I'm going to do in the world. Uh, we talked about social emotional learning. A lot of things that I related to was really SEL that people really don't catch. But be, we are human beings before we are human doers and we got to deal with the social emotional piece of, of our somebodyness before we start talking about what it is that we are going to do. Matter of fact, I was just in a gay club in New Orleans talking about STEM on, the, uh, on a podcast, and I talked about the fact that in STEM we have a pride day, and we go out into the community. We believe it's STEM for all, and we don't uh, make a, a choice about who we give STEM to. A lot of times when people start talking about STEM, we start picking and choosing who it's for. And if we start thinking about the community as a whole, Booker T. Washington said we are separate as the fingers, but as whole as the hand. And this panel shows you that we are separate as the finger. But if we come together, the whole hand can do a whole lot. 
And that's what Leroy was talking about with some of the academy, how they are trying to bring the pieces together. I just want to say, just because you have a lot of pieces, that don't mean the pieces are together. I work with a lot of STEM, STEM ecosystems across this, mm -hmm. across this country. The STEM Nola is a recognized STEM ecosystem of the STEM learning ecosystems. And many of the ecosystems is a hodgepodge, I say, of BS, because people think we just put everybody in a room, we got something functional, and it's not. You just got a whole bunch of people in a room. So what we got to do is not only get the people in a room, but understand, at its core, how do we operate as a unit, as the hand? Keep doing what you're doing as the finger. But how do we put this all together such that we begin to move all communities forward? What I didn't hear in a challenge and what John and I had been talking about since he met me and what people love about what we're doing is we are talking about scale. How do we take all of this and bring mm -hmm. it to scale? So at STEM NOLA, we have 30 full-time employees. We do STEM. I don't do pizza. I don't do art. Uh, I don't. <laughs> I like art. I don't do uh, uh, car washes. We do STEM. And what we, what we are trying to create is a trusted backbone for this nation, such that companies like 3M can come and reach out to and say, how are you doing this in New Orleans in a city that has one small publicly traded company? If we got a city with 20 plus multinational publicly traded companies, just think we can do if we begin to operate as the hand rather than ind individual uh, fingers. And I said something earlier, but I want to repeat it. In the 21st century, our children are only going to have three options. And they only, in the 21st century, they're only going to be able to take something, break something, and or make something. And if we don't give all of our children the education, the skills, the motivation, the inspiration to make something, like make a living, make a life, Audrey, or make a difference, it only gonna leave them with the two options that we see on the news every night. We saw what crack did to inner city. Now we're seeing what op opioids is doing in the rural areas. And that's why I'm about STEM for all and making sure all communities have the tools that they need to expose their kids to the possibilities of the 21st century. You all have a great foundation here. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We, we'd like to open up to questions from the floor, so if you have a question, please raise your hand, and Rhonda or I will come with the microphone. I think I want to. I think I want to start with scale. Um, I belong to a lot of organizations. I'm here at the U. I'm a physician, and one of my passions is STEM. And I belong to a lot of boards, and we're doing it. But everything is separate. I wonder how you can intentionally combine those efforts so that it is scalable up, hopefully, and that things are, you know, in a productive manner, increasing instead of. And I know there's no competition among it, among the different entities, but definitely there's a separate sort of separateness with each of the, of the groups that I work with. In other words, if I have a problem with a child, I don't say, why don't you go over here? For example, Starbase is a board I'm on. Starbase is a, is a DOD program that works with STEM. And I don't know if anybody's heard of that, but it's, yeah, but it's DOD sponsored. There's a lot of your taxpayers' money is going into it, and it's something that can be replicated everywhere, and it is just on basis. But the problem I see is that we're all separate entities. How do we intentionally combine that? If I may answer, I, I, see, the question is, when you, if you start from the wrong place, you never get to the end. So combining ain't the question. How do we combine? As soon as you say, how do we combine, you lose everybody. You know, that's, that's like that integration piece, right? People start thinking, do, what are you saying? Do, what do I have to give up about me to partner with you? My daddy used to tell me all the time, everybody ain't built for this, son. Some people built to do 30 kids a night for, for uh, 3D printing. Everybody not built to do, well, everyone is, let's say, somebody may be built to do a one-week camp in the summer. Stem Nola did 31 weeks of camps this summer. 
everybody not built for that. But the question is, how do we get together and, you know, and then take all of the camps and present to the community as a, a smorgasbord of the camps that's available to them? Look at the, the missing pieces in different areas and then make sure we got camps there. But I'm not trying to make Leroy and some academy become who I am. Right. I mean, that, so the language is very important. So when you start talking about scaling, the question becomes, what is it that we are trying to scale? Right. I'm very familiar with Starbase. I got a $3 million contract Department of Defense. I was just in Washington presenting you know, for the DOD STEM Forum. Now, it's scalable because DOD putting up the money and they got one or two sites in New Orleans or three or four in Huntsville. But I don't know if that's scalable across, across everything. You're only dealing with fifth graders you know, at, at, at one or two places. But the question is, can we take the ecosystem all right, and do an audit of the ecosystem and find out what everybody is doing and then scale the messaging to the community such that the community will know what's available to them. And then everybody continue to be who they are and do what they do. And then, you know, when you have this ecosystem in a clearinghouse, the question becomes about fidelity, right? Because everybody's not doing STEM. Some people are doing uh, arts and crafts disguised as STEM. And I call them out for their what I call educational malpractice. Everybody want to do STEM now. And just because you're saying it's STEM, it is not STEM. It's arts and crafts. So at some point, the ecosystem got to police itself. The, the ecosystem got to have standard structure and strategy. And then we operate as a unit. And that's the scaling part that we are talking about. Now, for me, now we're scaling STEM NOLA. We actually sat down with a company called BCG, Boston Consulting Group. And we found the parts of what we're doing in New Orleans. So we got the summer camps, we got after school, we got all of this. But the, the piece that's missing in most cities is that, is that organizing piece in the ecosystem that activates the ecosystem. And that's the piece that we're trying to scale, that we built the model around, and we know exactly how to enter a community, support a community, and get it going in the community such that it activates the ecosystem and everybody see a part of the action. Hi. <laughs> um, I'll just introduce myself again. I'm Leah Thomas. I'm an engineer at Stryker, and I was here earlier presenting my research with my team at Virginia Tech. So I guess a bit of a follow-up question to my earlier one. I was the kid who was doing arts and crafts all of my childhood, <laughs> and I always thought I, I considered being a fashion designer. Mm -hmm. I loved art and music, and now I'm an engineer. But I graduated from college last year, and I noticed there's this new trend of transdisciplinary work, which I got into, and that's when I discovered how much I love the field of engineering, because I'm able to use my creative side and my technical side at the same time, and that's when I feel alive. So I'm a strong supporter of teaching that to younger students, because I know that struggle of growing up and trying to figure out, is engineering right for me, which is, it's a male-dominated, very technical field, and I didn't know until I was able to include those aspects into it. So my question for you is, you all are doing such amazing work, and it's incredible to hear everything that you're doing with all of these kids, and I'm just curious, is this a trend that you are also seeing, this like push for transdisciplinary work that's kind of crossing disciplines, and if so, is that something that you're promoting in these, the future of the next workforce? Let, let, me, let, me, let me add, since you and I are going back and forth with this. <laughs> I hope Google isn't in a room. Somebody wrote an article and they said, Mackie, you know the nine, the, the, you know, in order to get a skill at, at to get, in order to get a job at Google, nine of the 10 skills you get from the arts. I said, that's interesting. I said, but the four founders of Google didn't have those skills. I'm raising two sons, and I'm raising my two sons to find and found and discover the next Google, not to work at Google. So where we start and our expectations for who we're dealing with, that's two different things. My sons play football and basketball as, as, a, as recreation. I'm not raising my two sons to try to come to Minnesota and be a football player or go to the NBA. 
I'm raising my two sons to have a hobby and have a sport and, and, you know, and, and have good conditioning. And one day own the NFL, uh, 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 NBA basketball team. That's two different things. But now I do have a son. And my son is going, he's, I told you earlier, he's got to choose between Yale. He's got to choose between South, uh, USC, Stanford, Morehouse, Howard. And my son is at the intersectionality of this. I've raised my kids to, to have this interdisciplinary view of things because I understand that innovation happens at those, at, at those intersectionalities. So I'm trying to understand this STEAM conversation because I don't think it's an either or. STEM people have been doing the arts forever. It's just until the arts people saw the money going to totally STEM that they want to have this conversation about, well, we need to put money into the arts. And I'm like, so be it. And the only thing I want is for arts to be the arts. My sons have taken arts, they play the piano, they've taken single lessons, they did violins, and that informs their STEM in a way that's absolutely unbelievable. I just don't want people out here saying that they're doing STEAM and they're not doing arts of the STEM. And the kids are not receiving anything from some program that's just uh, educational malpractice. And, 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 and I will never stop uh, fighting to make sure that all of our children receive authentic STEM that's with fidelity, that it will take them from one place to another, for example. School district came to me and they, they wanted me to bid, I bid it. And they said, look, what you're doing is great, but this, you know, your price is too much. And then the lady offline said, well, look, here's who we're going to go with. I said, that's fine. She said, what you think about this? And I said, uh, what, type, what type of conversation are we having? She said, what you mean? I said, is this Dr. Mackey and Dr. Johnson or is this Leah and Kelvin? She said, which one you want to have? I said, I want to have a Leah and Kelvin conversation because I don't want it to interfere with Dr. Mackey and Dr. Johnson. She, I said, may we have that conversation? She said, yeah. I said, what you just bought is educational malpractice. At the end of the summer, those kids are going to know how to draw a circuit. They're going to know how to spell circuits. They're going to know crayons and pictures. But that's not going to take them one step closer to what we're trying to get in terms of them being the innovators, creators, and makers in the world. That's the conversation we need to be having at its core. Many corporations are funding things to check boxes, knowing that that's not what middle class people are doing with their children. I've had funders I've gone into, we have a camp on one side of town, and you know, I said, I want to do that camp over here. They said, how much it costs? I said, it's $500 a kid. They said, why does it cost so much? I said, because the STEM didn't change its value because we crossed, we crossed town. What's changed was that person value proposition of the people that we are dealing with. And those are the equity issues that we must address. And I hit them head on, and I would never stop because it is not enough for our kids to participate in something called STEM, and they don't have any appreciation for science, technology, and engineering and mathematics when they come out of it. Hello, thank you so much everyone for your comments. This has been um, very um, good to hear and very informative. My name is Angela, I'm a professor and vice chair for research here at the University of Minnesota in the Department of Pediatrics. And we have a summer research program for um, students who are underrepresented in medical research. And it's part of our um, efforts to increase a pipeline, uh, to increase diversity in our department. And um, so this is a comment coming you know, from me as a white woman, although please do not presume I come from a background of privilege, because I certainly did not. Um, but, you know, We've been accused, actually, of causing emotional harm by trying to identify students who are underrepresented in order to participate in our program. You know, and, and, the, and the conundrum that we have is, okay, so we offer these, um, these summer internships that come with a stipend, and you know, the only way for students to find out about the ecosystem, right, is for those who are in the ecosystem to inform them about it. So how do we approach students who are underrepresented about these opportunities, you know, without inflicting this emotional harm that we've been accused of by people of color? Hello, hello. Um, Interesting perspective, so I'll, I'll go back to my school district days. It's about the how as opposed to the what. So for me, 
presenting something to young people of color who haven't had access to STEM before. It's presented them opportunities, options, um, opportunities to work in the pediatric research area, finding out what that's about, explaining that to them. That's one thing. It's another thing to identify, and I'm not saying you do this, but I've seen other places do this, identify by only the kids who get um, free and reduced lunch come forward, or if you're on a, um, a MFIP program, um, or those kind of things, those stigmatization things uh, tend to lead towards that, uh, what you described. But I have not seen, and I'm on the board of Achieve Twin Cities, I've been working with youth in 31 years I've been up here, I've not seen when you tell a young person or young people or groups, hey, we're gonna give you access to this opportunity in this particular area um, that has been stigmatizing for them. I'll give you an example. We started an internship program four years ago at Children's with eight students of color, and I intentionally said we're gonna hire students of color from Achieve, from Right Track, from Wallen Foundation, because these kids were underserved. We have 20 every year. They interview like every other kid, they get um, skill sets to be, you know, do well in the interview, get hired. Um, they're assessed like any other kid or young person, and they also get, um, you know, paid like any other kid. So I'm not s sure what's happening, and I'm willing to talk to you offline about what that stigmatization is or what people said about that, because I don't want to assume anything. But the thing about Minnesota in general, is we tend to stigmatize areas, behaviors, kids, and treat them differently as far as their programs are concerned, and treat them differently as far as bringing them in, and like they are less than any other kid who's learning STEM or any other academic area, and that tends to get in the way. So uh, I'd love to talk to you offline about more details about what you're speaking about, but when you open up the door for folks, uh, young people are young people, they wanna be, um, embraced, they want to learn, and they want to get excited about it. What they don't want to be treated as second class. They don't want to be treated as a special case. And hopefully that's not happening uh, as well. So I'll stop there. And if I can add, I, I see Ken is in the back. I, I want to give you an example of our partnership with FIRST Robotics. We know that FIRST Robotics is a wonderful program, and students that participate in that program tend to go on into, into STEM and in STEM careers. So what we've done with that partnership, we're trying to be more intentional and get more students, underrepresented students, to participate in the program. So we have this intentionality now with our approach. So we're looking at community organizations in certain communities. How can we really ensure that all students participate? And we know that some aren't. So how do we reach those students? So we're really looking at ways that we can come, uh, reach students and get them to engage in activities that will lead to STEM careers. Can I jump in here too? Um, and I'm actually, if everyone has said what they wanted to say about this question, I do want to jump back to Leah's question just really quickly. Um, uh, so I think that what I just would lay, the, the framing that I see is that, that actually that like STEM and the arts are not separate and cannot be separated, right? And so, um, for example, if I think about like a concrete example of we had our kids um, do a petri dish experiment where they're washing their hands or not, right? And then they observe what they have found in their results and they draw that on a sketch school iPad, right? And then they take those and print it and put it in the gallery and that is showing their sort of observational and um, so on skills, or, th or they learn about um, inherited or acquired traits, and then they go and they have clay and they can sculpt something to represent what they have learned. And I think that if you take the, those kinds of um, actual activities and try to separate out like which part of this is art and which part is uh, STEM, you find that it is all one thing, and actually there's an excellent book, Braiding Sweetgrass, which is by an indigenous woman who talks exactly about going into, um, being a freshman and going into um, her first class and just like her experiences trying to explain what her interest is in the natural science and feeling very excluded because her 
ex explanation of like the beauty being what draws her is, is sort of not, um, not allowed by her white male professor. And so... Um, oh, sorry. I was just going to add one more thing back to the DEI discussion. Oh, no, it's okay. It's good. It's good. It's good. Um, and that is, you know, I think um, we kind of, at, at the Kitty Anderson Youth Science Center, we really work on this identity piece and STEM identity. Um, and I think for us, um, it's not only just instilling the confidence and the identity in our young people, often young people of color, around seeing themselves uh, as um, uh, future STEM practitioners, um, but it's also preparing uh, the employers. We're starting to work very closely with employers to prepare them for the young people that we're working with who are going to be challenging these workplaces uh, to think differently about um, who belongs in STEM. Uh, and so it's really part and parcel for us. Uh, it's a connect, uh, it's two connected strategies for us to not only instill that identity within young people, but to also start changing our STEM workplaces um, so that they can start to see um, this wave of um, uh, the future, essentially, that our workforce is changing. And so it's very important for us um, to uh, create these spaces where employers can also learn about um, what uh, workplaces should look like to be accepting and inviting for, for folks of color. Hi, I'm Kiara Ellis. I am the Director of Community Outreach and Engagement for the Masonic Cancer Center here at the university. And thank you all for your comments and sharing your um, knowledge and information about your programs. I'm really curious about your success or I guess what you've noticed about how to scale infrastructure for your programming. Um, because I think that's one of the things that's often missing is like that infrastructure and then measuring impact because impact usually helps create funding for the work that we do both in community outreach and education that is often one of the problems and I may even speak to the point that you have around recruiting students for programs like this is sometimes it's your infrastructure doesn't really match what the output is expected or what you hope to make an impact in those students lives really look like um, so I have from from a funding perspective as well as uh, legacy programming, how you have scaled infrastructure and um, measured impact. What do you mean by infrastructure? I want to know what yeah. you Like your administration, your staffing, because you have 30 folks, mm -hmm. but I think like oftentimes when a programs that are focused on diversity in students or programming, they may come with a person. Um, nonprofits are lean, they run people to the ground basically <laughs> on passion, you know. <laughs> How do you start to scale and change that conversation? Because I do think in Minnesota specifically, we have a lot of silos of great programs and sometimes what, com what brings us together is collaboration, sometimes it's funding, um, but we're all working with this very lean structure that doesn't always allow us to grow or partner. I mean, that's a, that's a very good question. And, you know, we, when we first uh, launched out STEM, which is about four, four, eight, four years ago, um, to where we were then to where we are now, you know, one of the things we had to do was to, you know, how do, how do we manage growth? And we need to, number, number one, design who we were, who are we, right? Then we wanted to define what is success for us. Then the next we ask the question, how are we going to do it? Then what are the resources that require to get it done? Um, we begin to answer those four questions year after year uh, that we put together kind of a three year plan and say, here are the funding. First, we need to really outline what is it going to take for us to get to where we need to be over the next three, three years? What do we want to do? So it's kind of a thought out plan. Right, and sometimes well thought out plans just doesn't necessarily go according to plan, right? But, but you also have to have the funding, but you have to have the discipline. You have to have the discipline to figure out, okay, what is happening and have smart growth. I mean, there are folks who are uh, asking us right now, different communities around the state are asking us to come do this and do this, and we're like, we're not ready to do that. We don't have the capacity to do that. We would love to do that, but we can't. You need the resource uh, to get that. And, and, and the other thing is you, 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 just, you, you can't be everything to everyone. 
you have to figure out what your sandbox is. And, and uh, as Dr. Mackey said, you know, before, you can't do everything. What is your bubble? What is your sandbox? And you need to stay there. And you can go kind of an inch wide and a mile deep and just do that, right? And I think that's what we said and we defined that to just really manage the infrastructure it's going to take to grow into that. And we've grown over the several years um, that we're able to attract a diff um, a additional funding um, to get corporate engagement, to now get direct appropriation from Congress um, out, of, out of DC and out of the state because we want to, okay, what, what are the results? Now we're making impact and define the results, then that attracts more money to again to build the infrastructure to then make impact. So that's that smart growth that from a programmatic standpoint that is gonna take us to do that. So you have to be disciplined, otherwise you try to do everything, you get overrun and you get killed. Sure, I'll try to make it quick. Um, I think Dr. Mackey said, costs $500 per student. If I said do it for $100 per student, could you do a quality job? No, I'm not gonna do it, the answer is no. There you go, That's right. not gonna do it. I think some companies, institutions say with DEI especially, go ahead and make magic happen with one person and no budget and no money. And I'll use us as an example. I would have not taken this job four years ago but for having an entire department of five people in equity and inclusion, uh, in addition to myself as a senior vice president, and having a budget that's much beyond budgets of organizations that are five times our size. Why? Because our equity and inclusion work is in our strategic plan. It's two out of the six things that our board evaluates us on. We measure it by not only how many people we hire, how many people we retain, what are our patient outcomes, and equity is a domain of quality with respect to medical uh, service. And if you're not gonna use equity and, and measure it, don't pretend you have it. So a lot of companies, let me be honest, are pretending. They're pretending to say, I'll do diversity, equity, inclusion work. How many people you got in your department? One. And then they're like, okay, well, man, I don't know how we're getting results because you're spending $100 on a 500 or $5 million problem issue. Uh, and it's holding people accountable. There's something recently, I think 40 companies are being sued based upon statements that they made around George Floyd's murder. Uh, and then afterwards they said they're gonna do all this DI stuff. Now they're being sued by their own employees around not getting the work done. Uh, I'll be interested to see what happens with that. I'm not worried about it because we've been doing the work and we'll continue to do it. And you gotta have a leader that's willing to invest in it. The outcomes of the impact you talked about may not be right away because what we forget is systemic structural, institutional, whatever you want to call it, racism, has existed for a long time. And this is the system that's built upon its foundation. So I can't change it in three years or three months and say, you know what, we fixed it. It's cool now, we got everything done. It's gonna take a long time. So investing in that, measuring impact along the way, and then investing more, I think is gonna be important. I know, Nitro, let me add. You know, if you go to Devo Center for Nonprofits, they have this cycle and they say you do good you do great work you market the great work you build a you build a tribe they're talking about art but they're talking about a following and then you monetize that and you do and you continue that cycle right and i try to help people in the organization we started with a hundred thousand dollars my wife and i in our garage and we've grown it to five million dollars a year in little bitty new orleans uh, because one the value proposition we don't compromise it they, we have people that want to deal, want to work with us. They don't want to pay what we know it costs to deliver. And I refuse to work with them because this is what it costs. And I'm not going to give our children something that otherwise doesn't meet that standard because I got to do great work. And if I do great work and I market it, I'm a, I'm, I'm a billy following. And then, that, then we're going to monetize that following to get more money to even do greater work. Like I said earlier, right, if you're in your company or you're in your organization, and the value proposition for me, for people like 3M, is that I look at their value proposition. I mean, one company said, well, we have five pillars. And I said, you know, I started in remedial reading, but Kelvin can read. And I read your five pillars. And we are problem solvers. So when I go to companies, I read their documentation, and I model, we build our STEM effort to what they say they want. So when they say they don't want what we've presented, that means they're not even following their own pillars. But they definitely can't say, what, what most people are used to is, is one-trick ponies. 
So they say, I do robotics. You go talk to them, they say, we don't fund robotics. I go to people and I say, what do you want? Because we solve problems. So if you're a bank and you want analytics and data science and you want uh, artificial intelligence, guess what? We're going to go back and we're going to build a STEM program to address that for you. A lot of people are not used to that. But I know I need that because that's the way I do great work. I market the work. If you follow me on social media, uh, you'll see, uh, I mean, I, I spend a couple of hundred thousand dollars a year as a nonprofit pushing out images that people otherwise have never seen before. We take a kid, put a kid on the news every other week in a white lab coat, presenting science in a way that adults going, oh, wait a minute. The general manager come out and say, where did you find those kids? I said, those failing schools. So now the school's saying, well, if that's my kid and you did that with my kid, what about the rest of the kids? Well, that's on you, but you got to pay for it. And this is what it cost me to get a kid to that point. And that's what I'm talking about, 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 about educational malpractice, right? And that's what James is referring to. If it costs $500 to get this middle class kid to this level, would make us think a kid in a low socioeconomic realm deserve anything less. But you do the great work, you market the work, you build your tribe, go where you're celebrated, not where you're tolerated. And those people that celebrate you are going to continue to fund you and you keep that cycle going, even within an organization. And just as a funder, quickly, I want to add, I mean, we do look at, you know, program ratio, how much is spent on admin versus program, and then that's a factor that goes into it. But one of the things that we've recognized, too, it's really important to look at the program and the outcomes. And Correct. if that program is delivering the outcomes that we want to see, we will make that investment. Um, mm -hmm. And we, we're trying to do more now in terms of general operations. Uh, versus program expenses. We know it takes a lot to run programs and we just don't want to earmark things for a program and not necessarily fund all of the stuff that needs to go with it. Yeah. Oh. Are we on? All right, awesome. Um, so, Go, going around this room, we have a lot of people that have succeeded a lot in their careers. We also have a lot of people that are, you know, in the future going to be doing things in the world and that have opportunities to interface with uh, groups and organizations like yours, as well as people who are not involved in the good work that you're doing. And so what I would like to know from you is when you're, if one of us is in a room with someone who is a, you know, a change maker, someone who can make change but is not actively doing so at the moment, right? What are the green lights that you can see in somebody that would say, you know, this person, we can, we can get them to invest and be involved in this in a proper and sufficient way? And what are the uh, tactics that you would use to bring someone around to the better side of history? <laughs> You want to take that? <laughs> you don't want me to take that. Look, young brother, I don't do well. I don't do well on panels. And I don't do well on panels because I'm not controlled by an institution. I walked away from the academy because I was convinced that the, the problem that I was trying to solve is not in the institution. It's out there in those streets. Yeah. And I can't have institutions telling me what I can and cannot do when I know what's needed in those streets. I got to have one foot in the street to know what they need so that we can create what they need because they need a solution that otherwise may not come from the institution, first and foremost. I would come across a lot of people in a position to be change makers that ain't making any change whatsoever. One of the biggest issues I have with a lot of my friends, and I was talking about this earlier, who are now presidents of universities, I said, man, what happened to you? What is it about you now that you running universities? We said we was gonna change the world and we've been talking about this 30 years and now I got a solution and you can't see the solution I got. So maybe having a black president wasn't the answer. Maybe we need somebody who otherwise committed to the community from which we came, whether they black, white, and a woman to make the difference. So I, I deal with a lot of people that are change makers or in change maker positions that refuse to do what's necessary to make a change. And granted, a lot of my friends in corporate America, but I got friends in the White House, and I understand the risk uh, proposition that's before there. So that's why we've been doing this work for 10 years. We've documented everything. We got stewardship. Any data you want, we got the number of steps the kids to take, 
have taken, the food they eat <laughs> when they wake up, whatever you need, we got the data. And still some people in positions of power would not make the decision and the investment to do what they claim that they want to do. You leave those people alone. You, I said it earlier, go where you're celebrated, not where you're tolerated. You cannot bring people along. We have, we have to have a sense of urgency around the work that we are doing now, like our life dependent on it. Because you know what? Our life is dependent on it. We had a medical device uh, conference, and literally biases and, and algorithms and medical devices are killing people that look like me. I can't bring you along. I got to go find the people that otherwise going to make it right. So, you know, and, but everybody ain't built for that. Calvin not built for that. You know, I got, a, I got people in my family built for that, and they go and sit down and talk to the people, and I whisper in there, tell them this, because if I talk to them, it's not going to end well for me. <laughs> you, you got it? And you got to have both. But, but that's not me. And that's why I left the university, because I'm like, I'm tired of the conversations. We're going to do the work. When you are ready, we're going to be out here doing the work. What bothers me and my pain point is that people claim that they want the solution. The solution is there and they're not willing to take the step. And, you know, just to add, you know, that has been uh, similar to our approach, is what, what is the solution? I mean, we tackle hard issues that nobody wants to tackle. Nobody wants to go on the street in North Minneapolis and talk to those folks and bring them in and say, there is a future for you. This is a path and how it goes. And to be able to connect there. Nobody wants to touch that. You got people transitioning out of prison. You can't take a pencil and erase them off the planet, okay? You got to figure out what you're going to need to do with them, talk to them, love them, and give them the skills so that they can be successful. In our construction programs, we got people who are transitioning out of prison. Our average age is about 26 years old, and in 20 weeks, we can put them making 42000 a year. Now, they are models in that community where they're going to work and coming home, and then they can then bring their kids to a STEM Saturday where they get exposed to an opportunity before they make the same mistake that their parents made. Kids don't get a chance to pick their parents, okay? So we have to get a, a, a create a system in a way so that um, kids are exposed to an opportunities early so that they don't get a chance to make those mistakes. So what we do is that's why we focus on those schools uh, that are poor, right? Because they don't have an opportunity. We meet them where they at so that we can provide what entry point that they can come in. And it may cost 500 bucks or it may cost less, but it's worth right now to get somebody at two days a week if they're off the street and they're all of a sudden getting exposed to something, now they're going to increase because they can't do what they don't know. So how do we now go in these streets and really connect with them, bring them in, connect them to some of the corporate partners so they're seeing people that look like them and they're like, wow, you're a doctor. Wow, you're an engineer. I didn't know I can be that. And that's inspiring enough. And then all of a sudden, they have you know, this shining star in their eyes and say, hey, I can do that. So all of a sudden now, instead of two days a week, they're coming five days a week. And all of a sudden now, they're coming through the ecosystem. Now they're going to Harvard and Yale. right? So uh, uh, you know, certainly, you have a lot of folks that we wanted, uh, those who have made it, who have blazed the trail and they're successful. We want them to come back and to especially to the communities that we're serving that are underserved so that they can see people that look like them and maybe not look like them but maybe just say, what are your interests? And maybe expose them to it. We have gaming. That's a hook. Kids don't know when we bring them in, everybody likes a game. Well, there's technology behind that. There are jobs behind that. All of a sudden, we get to expose them, and they say, wow, I didn't know that we can do that. All of a sudden, it piques their interest. Now, they're in application development or gaming and developing things. So those that that's, has been our approach, and really tackling some of the challenging issues that no one wants to challenge, uh, tackle in the communities that no one really wants to go into. And, and I kind of lied. I want to finish by saying this. You bring people along by doing the work. And I'm thinking about one example. Uh, this, this lady worked for a major corporation, and she pretty put out in the community, she said, I will never fund him based on, you know, just my, the way I talk about the problem. And recently, recently we were on a commercial together, and my wife keeps saying, how, how did you get her from that point to that point? And that was by doing the work. Mm -hmm. And she could not not see the work. And I believe one day there was a day when she looked at the work and said, 
I better get on this train. You know, now she said she wasn't gonna fund it, but this train had left the station. And she said, you know what? I better get on this train. And we brought politicians along. I got $2 million in congressional money, $2 million in what, uh, uh, capital outlay from the governor, a million from the city. And it doesn't matter if they're Republican or Democrat, right? Red or blue. I live in a blood red state. And I, I have people funding me because you know what they see? The work. Now, the challenge for many of us is that where do we find the resources to continuously do the work when people wouldn't fund us to start off? And that's why they, they try to drown you so you'll die on the vine, right? Before they even have to get to that point. But we've lasted long enough where they have to say, I better get on this train. So we have brought people along. I just want to put that out there for you. Hello. Okay. Uh, well, I wanted to thank the panel. This has been awesome. Uh, really stimulating conversation. You want to put it right there? Yeah. Is that good, Kelvin? That's good. Is That's that better, good? John. All right. <laughs> so you know, I'm going to have to come to you, Kelvin, with this question because we've been talking about this, right? So we, I got inspired watching Kelvin give a talk in front of the ERC biennial, and, and we sat down. We had a drink together, and we were talking. And I was like, how could we bring STEM NOLA up into the Twin Cities? And, and you know, Kelvin was like, well, I've been looking at the Twin Cities. I, I want to come up to the Twin Cities. And so then we, we had some further conversation. And I was like, well, can you kind of like think about what that would take? What, what a proposal would be to bring it up and, and show us that, you know, we can interact with the community, which we're seeing here on this wonderful panel. And we have the industry in the room, and you've met the You've met the university leaders and my deans right behind me here. So, Kelvin, I'm going to put you on the spot, man. What's it going to take to bring STEM Twin Cities up here? Can you reflect on that a little bit just to close us out tonight? The, the answer is yes. Uh, <laughs> I mean, what would it take, right? Now, I've thought about that a lot. I said earlier that we met with BCG. And BCG did a six-week sprint to build out our uh, scaling plan because they said this is something that's too important to just let you try to figure it out. You've done a good job, but you know, BCG think they know everything. And they did bring a lot to the table. Uh, and there was about a million dollars in consulting that they poured in us over six months. To the point where BZ, B, BCG said, look here, we don't want to go away. They said, any city you go into and want to go into, first and foremost, let us know, and we'll activate our ecosystem. You got 20 plus multinationals here. They paying BCG billions of dollars, if, you know, or close to it. That's, that's one way. First thing you got to do is identify who's going to be what I call the edge evangelist. Who's going to own this, right? Is it going to be the University of Minnesota? Is it going to be Summit Academy? Somebody in the community got to own it. People in, in Minneapolis don't want NOLA. They don't want Kelvin. They want something that they know being curated and designed for them. So first and foremost, you, you establish that. Uh, it's, it's going to take resources. Sitting down with BCG, we've measured what it took. We look at a collective impact model, even if it costs a, a million dollars, right? I mean, you can't find 20 companies or 20 individuals to put up $50,000 a year. I mean, in a city as wealthy as this, I can't go and go to the community foundation that you probably have, and they just have a reception and bring in uh, 20 of the most wealthiest people in the world and say this is something that's been tried across and it, we believe it'll work here and would you become founding members at 50000 that's $150,000. The New Orleans Saints just gave me $2,500 for the first time and my congressman had to stand on my head because I said they spend more money than that on Sundays on the alcohol and, and in the suite and I was going to go tell her on. He said, Kelvin, don't tell her. You'll just let's see what she's going to give you next year. But the NBA just gave us $300,000. And that's, that, that precipitated the Saints giving us 2500 So if the Saints was really committed to the community, where's the investment? So first and foremost, you curate people that otherwise want something like this. You curate the people who otherwise got the resources and say they, say they really want to fund it. And then we find the people that otherwise gonna, gonna champion it you know, in the community. Only thing we provide is the technical assistance. Uh, what I said earlier, two off beef patties, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions on a sesame seed bun. 
We've built the barbecue grill. Our SOP is 400 pages, and we teach communities um, from how to recruit, how to raise funds. Uh, we got the checklist, how you make robocalls, everything you need to do to get the same results. Uh, we teach community to do it. So this is, this is a great impetus. This is where we start. CORE, the organization here at uh, Minnesota that, that I talked to earlier, they, they have the, all of the components to, to own something like this and bring it to the community. But it got to be community working in the community and then marshalling other people there. So you have all the pieces. What's, what's not there is the, is the nexus of individuals that we need to sit down and move, you know, not have eight, nine conversations. Because like we're in, we're in Mobile, Alabama right now. We're in Saginaw, Michigan. Literally in six weeks, we, we, we jumped off those things because we didn't have a lot of conversation. Once stuff gets started, people are like, whoa, there's STEM Alabama. We didn't have one conversation with STEM Alabama. STEM Alabama has been meeting four years, haven't done nothing. It's just people having meetings. And we've activated an entire ecosystem in Mobile, Alabama. And now STEM Alabama going, well, can we talk? Because now they see action. You've got to start somewhere. As engineers, we know that. Scientists will study stuff forever. Engineers, we got to go. <laughs> <laughs> we got to go. We got to build STEM, STEM Minneapolis 1.0, then 2.0, then 3.0, then 4.0, and improve upon that. And I promise you this. A whole lot of people are not going to show up to get it done. Yeah. I mean, if you accept that, then we can get something done. Amen. All right. You want to close it out? Yeah. All right, I want to thank the panel very much for all of your insights and wonderful, uh, flexible uh, thoughts around the questions. And I really want to thank the audience that was uh, the, the young people and the more mature people who brought their experiences and questions to this panel to enlighten all of us. This is the first time we've had this type of conversation. I've been here 25 years as a professor, and this is the first time I've been a part of this type of general conversation around this topic. I know a lot of people are doing a little bit, but that fascia that connects and encompasses the, the, the larger muscular, musculature of the system is not there. And I think as we all know uh, from experience that the connectivity in the right way is probably a good part of the next step. So I'd like the audience to thank our panelists, and I'd like to thank our audience as well. Rhonda, you're sounding more like a biologist than an electrical engineer. I love it. <laughs> I'm learning. I'm and learning. I, and I'd like us to give it up to the people that put this together, because if you're saying it's the first time you've seen it in 25 years, people should be congratulated for bringing this together. Yeah. Absolutely. It has been a, a, uh, an amazing thing to see uh, our, our staff. I'm not sure where they are at this point, but I can promise you, uh, Catherine is a force to be reckoned with. Yeah, Catherine. And she makes everything happen, lightning speed. So uh, as I said to Calvin, and Ken and Jarese, and where are they? They made. And Andrew, I'm not sure where they are. They all move mountains to put this together and to connect all these different dots based on their different experiences. So we owe, I am very grateful to that. Um, one last thing I'd like to just kind of remind you all of is we, um, I know we don't have a way to say who came to this. So um, it would be helpful to us if we could make sure that there's some connection and you can go into if you're from the university, you can go to the IEM, just Google that, and if you could send an, an email to inspire at umn.edu, just saying, hey, I was at that panel. If you have any thoughts, share them. That would at least allow us to reconnect with you as we figure out what we want to do next or what the community decides to do next, because we don't have a way to reach out to you individually. But it is now. 801. So I want to thank you for your time and hopefully we'll have more conversations for verb action soon. 